I, I think my talk is probably of the uh, excellent innovation talks to follow, the least innovative. And I saw there was an excellent session on uh, interoperative monitoring as a pre-meeting. And looking at the cases that have been presented, you know, I know there's quite a lot of use of interoperative neuromonitoring here, and I suspect, like in the States, there's a, a wide variation in terms of who uses how much and when. And so rather than give kind of an overview talk for this, I thought I thought I would try to answer some assertions and questions that I frequently hear from my colleagues in the States. Now, one is this doesn't add value for the kinds of surgery I do. Uh, even if there's an alert, that's just a way to give me a quick uh, bout of angina. There's nothing you can do about it anyway. There's too many false positives. Uh, and really, more important issues, what do I need to know and how can I optimize this to, um, to best effect? So, you know, the, the fact is that simple laminectomies and discectomies may not be the most appropriate for intraoperative neuromonitoring, but pretty much any other case is a relatively good value proposition. Uh, when there is an alert, knowing how to interpret a real from a false alert and knowing how to respond is a critically important thing. And ultimately, no test is perfect, but the use of intraoperative monitoring can be improved. Uh, if you work together with the neuromonitoring team. And I think in the States, we have people that are very expert in the, in the underlying physiology behind uh, intraoperative neurological monitoring, but there are other spine surgeons who think of it kind of as a black box where they ask for a neurologic monitoring and they expect an answer, but they really haven't engaged in the process or how the monitoring is achieved. And you really can't think of it that way. Now, I know resources are available throughout the world. I actually uh, met Dr. Jan Giri last year at the meeting in Riyadh, and I know that he's practiced in the States and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, but there are uh, resources for those people who aren't as familiar with some of the underlying concepts behind neurologic monitoring. Uh, so, back to the first question. This doesn't really add value for the types of spine surgeries I perform. Sure, it might be good for scoliosis surgery, but why should I do it on my cervical spine surgeries? The truth is there are differing value propositions for different indications from intradural tumors on the one side to a microdiscectomy on the other. And even within a procedure, different stages of the procedure have relatively different value. But using cervical spine surgery as an example, there are a number of areas where you can benefit with intraoperative neurologic monitoring. One is it helps with your uh, anesthe depth, of, depth of anesthesia and your um, cardiopulmonary uh, monitoring. If you're trying to keep your mean arterial pressures above 85, that will uh, affect the rates of alerts with your, M uh, with your MEP monitoring. Uh, if you're worried about the recurrent laryngeal nerve in a revision or a particularly long reconstruction, that can be monitored. One thing I see frequently is aggressive taping of the shoulder to try to get better lateral images down to the cervicothoracic junction, and that can lead to traction injury to the brachial plexus, which is often picked up on SSCP. When you're actually in the meat of the procedure, uh, monitoring can keep you out of trouble here too, especially in cases with OPLL or significant cord compression. It's helpful in root level problems in terms of identifying the irritated root and avoiding excessive traction. This is an example from uh, Dr. Hillebrand. Uh, he was doing a corpectomy and he was getting nice uh, MEP traces, which you see on the top until he got to the placement of the cage when suddenly the MEPs were lost. And they did an assessment and they felt that they had over distracted the spine. So they took that piece, that cage out and they put a smaller one in and ultimately the uh, signals returned and the patient was neurologically intact. If they had left that longer cage in, you know, perhaps that patient would have had a permanent injury. So do these alerts really affect outcomes? Well, obviously, doing a level one study and randomizing patients will never really be ethical. There are a number of controlled animal studies where an insult is generated and then relieved once a monitoring change occurs, and those clearly show the ability to mitigate the neurologic damage. And then there are a variety of level three and level four studies. This is a thousand cervical spine cases from the Toronto group, and they 
they, this series was limited to one spinal cord injury, iatrogenic cord injury, uh, out of that more than 1,000 cases. And interestingly, that was in a patient with a simple disc herniation uh, with a simple radiculopathy. And so they concluded that because of the devastating nature of a cerebral cord injury, they did recommend use of monitoring. In the uh, Washington University series, when Dan Rue was there, they did uh, assessment of more than 12,000 cases, of which 3,500 were cervical. And there they got alert rates of about 3%, but the ultimate neurologic deficit rate was only 0.12%, and they attributed that delta to the impact of responding to these alerts. So as you try to develop your own team, if you're uh, either new to neurologic monitoring or let's say you're building a complex spine program in your hospital and you want to take the monitoring up a notch, who has to be part of that team? Ultimately, anesthesia is a critical part of doing good monitoring. Um, there's obviously a number of agents that affect the monitoring signals, which we're not going to get into right now. Um, there are a number of places where the surgeon does the supervision of the monitoring entirely. In the United States, that's not a good idea for medical legal reasons. I would say in any other place, the worst time to try to be interpreting signals is when you're also trying to treat the patient on the table, and it really gives you too many duties at the same time. So having a clinical neurophysiologist uh, in helping to interpret the signals and monitoring is very helpful. And in the U.S., that's typically done remotely, but you can communicate directly with them through the computer. The technicians themselves are very important, and at least in the States, there's quite a bit of variability in terms of their skill level. As you work up cases, especially more complex cases, there are a number of discussion points uh, that are going to be helpful both to the monitoring team and to anesthesia. Does the patient already have a posterior column problem that's going to limit the ability to get good SSCPs? Is the patient, does the patient have fat extremities or a lot of edema that's going to make uh, obtaining uh, signals difficult? You want a clear monitoring plan with various stages of the surgery so that they can anticipate when monitoring is going to be the most important. In some of my cervical cases, you know, I'm worried about the flip. I'm worried about positioning in too much extension, for example. And every step of the way, I'm going to want to be in very close communication with the team. Um, another issue is electrodes. I'm going to go over those in a second, but you'll often find a lot of variability from one facility to another. And if you if you only use uh, monitoring in one facility, you'll be surprised at what you find if you go to another one. Uh, ultimately, what this discussion does is with routine use of monitoring, so not necessarily every case, but most of your medium and larger cases, is it develops an efficiency within that team that allows it to be not only a faster process, but also a much better process. For example, you get to figure out what the interference patterns for your OR are, from the table to the headlight to the electrocautery. Uh, the anesthesia team, if they're not particularly familiar with TIVA or the impact of different agents, everyone will very quickly start to develop a pattern that works with the monitoring. I think ultimately a lot of that has to do with clear communication. You know exactly what they're trying to tell you. In the States, there are people from all over, obviously, and so uh, communicating clearly can be an issue sometimes. Here are just some of the electrodes that I thought I would show. Uh, one of the hospitals I went to, the uh, monitoring personnel love these sticky surface electrodes, which are great because they're no stick and there's no sharps. The problem is they create quite a lot of stimulation artifact, and, and so if you really want to get better signals, I would recommend against them. Subdermal needles are very frequently used and are uh, probably the workhorse in my institution. Uh, I think there is a sharps risk here. They pull out frequently. Um, covering with tegaderm can be very helpful to lower that risk. But in Texas, uh, the size of the patient's another big issue. And so if they're coming in with a 15 millimeter needle and you know the muscle's at least two centimeters deep, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to hit the target with the needle. Um, in terms of the scalp side, you can use the needle electrodes. These gold cups were used in the Cleveland Clinic where I did my uh, residency. Uh, patients complained bitterly about the collodion and the, uh, and the acetone in their hair, um, but they, they certainly tend to stick once they're in place. In certain cases where placement is critical uh, and security of the lead is critical, these corkscrew electrodes are great. There's, 
increased surface area, which decreases impedance, uh, but they are more expensive, and most critically, they bleed a lot when you take them out. Um, epidural electrodes and probes, these are all things that should be planned out ahead of time. You need to make sure that the right equipment's available. So just to go quickly through some of the alarm criteria, um, so with the uh, SSAPs, you're taking afferents typically from the median and tibial nerves through the dorsal columns and lateral sensory tracts. And an alert would be a drop of 50% in amplitude or an increase of 10% in latency. MEPs are monitoring the corticospinal tracts, and it's critical to know about the contraindications here as we get more and more patients with deep brain stimulators, cochlear implants, and so on. Another big issue can be the bite block because of the stimulation and prone patients in particular. Uh, you don't want them to bite their tongue. The problem with MEPs, as great as they are as a sensitive test for cord problems, uh, the cr alarm criteria are evolving, and there are several listed here. Typically, the all or none reporting is what I still see most frequently. Spontaneous EMG, I think, speaks for itself. I think a critical thing here is if you give the patient some paralytic at the beginning of the procedure because they have very tight muscles or they're very deep, you want to make sure that you've timed that in a way that it'll wear off before you start placing implants or doing your decompression. You need at least a three twitches out of your train of four to get an effective um, uh, spontaneous EMG reading. Another issue is selecting which muscles to record. If you're particularly worried about, let's say, C5, you want to monitor at least two C5 muscles, so the deltoid and the biceps. Here are the typical abnormal EMG findings, which also speak for themselves and are fairly self-explanatory. It goes from quiet to a burst, for example. Uh, when you do a triggered EMG, you're counting on the screw being placed in bone which insulates it from the nerve. The thinner that bone is, and especially if there's a breach, the stimulation threshold required to pass signal through to that nerve goes way down. Here too, alarm thresholds and literature have varied over time, and they also vary by where you are craniocaudally in the spine. But I would say that if you can hit 15 milliamps, you can be fairly confident that your screw has not breached to a nerve root at least. Uh, important things to know about triggered EMG are that pre-existing root injury can affect the read and typically have a higher uh, triggering threshold. Patients that are deeper, bloody, have tissue around the screw head will give you an improper read. Uh, you want to place the probe tip directly on the screw and not on the uh, top of the polyaxial head. Ultimately, when you think about what you're doing in your coming surgery, you're worried about cord or you're worried about nerve. Uh, the reality is for most cord level cases, SSCP and MEP are complementary, and so I would use both when I can. In most cervical cases, you'll also do at least some EMG monitoring. For most caudal level cases, SSCP and EMG are useful uh, by themselves. Why that's important is, uh, depending on the size of the case and the number of levels you're treating, most of even the new good uh, monitoring machines have either 16 or 32 channels, so you don't have an infinite number of things you can monitor. How do you respond to these changes? There should be a detailed plan. Uh, first, if you just placed a screw or a cage rod, remove that. Check vascularity, the blood pressure. Check patient temperature, limb position, anesthesia status especially if there have been alerts both in, in two modalities, but SSEP and MEP together, you want to minimize the remaining surgery and do a wake-up test. So in conclusion, uh, intraoperative monitoring is not a black box request. This will work for you better if you get involved in the process and if there's clear communication in the uh, operating room about what your intentions are and what you want from the monitoring. Um, I think that changes to the anesthesia plan are often necessary for best monitoring, and in this setting, false negative monitoring has occurred, but it is pretty rare. Thank you.